Now, we've talked from time to time about the importance to bringing the Jewishness and the Hebrew language and culture back into Christianity and back into the basic understanding of the Holy Scriptures. And here in the next few verses of Genesis 19, we're going to get an example of just why that's so important. Now, let me preface this by saying something about the translator and the writer of the complete Jewish Bible that I read to you from. He is a Messianic Jew. So while he brings the Jewishness back into the scriptures, he also brings some long-standing Jewish tradition with him that can swing the translation from having the typical overweighted Gentile bent that we're all used to reading in our English Bibles to at times having a somewhat overweighted traditional Jewish bent. And it shows up here because his Jewish background causes him to not use God's name, yud heh vav -Hey, Yahweh or Yehovah. And instead he substitutes the word Adonai, or like we find in our English Bibles, Lord. And we will find that throughout the complete Jewish Bible. So, open your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 19. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is on page 18. And we're going to start reading at verse 13 and only go to 29. Genesis chapter 19, starting at verse 13. And we'll back up and start at 12. The men said to Lot, Do you have any people here besides yourself? Whomever you have in the city, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, bring them out of this place because we're going to destroy it. Adonai has become aware of the great outcry against them, and Adonai has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke with his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up and leave this place because Adonai is going to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law didn't take him seriously. And when the morning came, the angels told Lot to hurry. Get up, they said, and take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Otherwise, you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he dallied. So the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, the hands of his two daughters. Adonai was being merciful to him and led them, leading them outside the city. And when they had brought them out, he said, flee for your life. Don't look behind you. Don't stop anywhere in the plain, but escape to the hills. Otherwise, you'll be swept away. And Lot said to them, Please, no, my Lord, here your servant has already found favor in your sight, and you have shown me even greater mercy by saving my life. But I, I can't escape to the hills, because I'm afraid that disaster will overtake me, and I'll die. Look, there's a town nearby to flee to. It's a small one. Please, let me escape there. Isn't it just a small one? And that way I'll stay alive. And he replied, all right, I agree to what you have asked. I won't overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape to that place, because I can't do anything until you arrive there. For this reason, the city was named Zoar. By the time the lot had come to Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then Adonai caused sulfur and fire to rain down upon Sodom and Gomorrah from Adonai out of the sky. He overthrew those cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, everything growing in the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a column of salt. Avraham got up early in the morning. He went to the place where he had stood before Adonai, and he looked out towards Sodom and Gomorrah, scanning the entire plain. And there before him, the smoke was rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. But when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remember, remembered Abraham and sent Lot out, away from the destruction, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. In verses 13 and 14, where my complete Jewish Bible reads Adonai, and if you have a non-complete Jewish Bible, it probably reads the Lord, the actual original Hebrew was yud heh vav -Hey. Yehovah. And who's Yehovah? The Lord God Almighty is being referred to here by his actual personal name. When the two angels explained that Yehovah sent them, 
and Yehovah has instructed them to destroy the city. A pre-incarnate Jesus didn't instruct them. The Holy Spirit did not instruct them. God the Father, Yehovah, who Gentile Christians call Jehovah, instructed them. So verse 13 actually reads, Yehovah has become aware of the great outcry against them, and Yehovah has sent us to destroy it. Let me be very clear, since it is amazing what some seem to think I mean by this. The word Yehovah, the Hebrew letters Yud, He, Vav, He, are actually literally there. This isn't speculation. This is not a doctrine. It's not a tradition. This isn't substitution, nor do we find it in some ancient Hebrew manuscripts, but not in others. The word Yehovah is there. It's there in all original Hebrew manuscripts so far discovered in a place of where our Bibles typically say Lord or God. A little, little further down now in verse 18, Lot responds to the angels who are telling him to leave by saying, please, no, my Lord. Now, did Lot think he was talking to God, Jehovah, or that now aware that these men weren't men, he was addressing angels? The word used in this verse for Lord is Adonai. And as I've mentioned before, Adonai can be used to refer to God or can simply mean a generic Lord or a master. A Lord or a master of any sort, human or spiritual. Here, the actual original Hebrew text is, please know Adonai. And within the context, it's not referring to God. It's referring to the generic form of Adonai. Lot was responding to the angels by calling them Adonai, lords, masters. Okay? It was just a way of speaking a sign of respect and courtesy, like we might say sir or ma'am. And in this case, it also was recognizing their power and their authority. Now, I wanted to point this out, not because the meaning of our Bibles is necessarily wrong, but because when we understand this expanded meaning that Hebrew gives us, we understand what's going on so much more clearly. We can know more precisely which manifestation of God is speaking in chapter 19. Now, some of you might be thinking, is that really so important? Oh, yes, it is. It is these sorts of bits and pieces that we can put together so as to understand the scriptures more accurately. And remember, at least half of the New Testament is Old Testament quotes. And the book of Revelation is primarily a compiling of the Old Testament prophecies and putting them into a kind of a chronological order, or in some cases merely connecting a bunch of prophetic dots. So if we really want to understand what's happening in the New Testament, we need to get the Old Testament right first. Well, Lot leaves, taking his wife and two unmarried daughters with him, but these so-called sons-in-law won't go. They simply don't believe what the angels have told them. Bad idea. Angels are messengers from God. That's their purpose. So it's best that we heed them. The sons-in-law didn't survive their skepticism. Neither did Lot's wife. These so-called sons-in-law are a little bit of a mystery, mainly because the Hebrew here isn't very clear. The term could mean men to whom Lot's daughters were engaged, or more likely it was that these were husbands to other daughters of Lot. In either case, they would have been men of Sodom. They would have been pagans. Here's a little clue when reading the Bible. If you only see one or two children mentioned, it's probable that the couple had other children as well. There's just not reason to speak of them because they play no role in the story. In the biblical era, for someone to have only two or even three children would have indicated either the deaths of some other of their children 
or that they were very young and had just started out having a family, or there was something medically wrong with either the husband or the wife. A minimum, bare minimum, of five or six children would have been the norm. And due to disease and other hazards, some of the children dying at a young age was usual and it was expected, as heartbreaking as it was. So you can draw your own conclusions about whether Lot had more children than the two daughters mentioned, uh, but I'm certain he did. Now apparently Lot still didn't recognize the nature of this imminent danger from what was about to occur. The angels told him to hurry up and leave, but he didn't seem to get it. He, he apparently was kind of taking his time, packing up, checking his list, making sure he didn't forget anything of importance. So one of the angels intervened and grabbed him by his hand, grabbed his two daughters' hands, the ones that were there, and dragged them outside the city walls. Now here we should remember a type or a pattern that's being established. Recall that upon the angel's arrival, only a few hours earlier, Lot made matzah, unleavened bread for them to eat. Now he has to hurry. You can bet, even though it's not stated, that the food he took with him was that unleavened bread that he had made the evening before the morning he was about to flee. And of course, the type and pattern is carried forward several centuries later to make the, to the making of unleavened bread before Israel hurriedly left another wicked place called Egypt. So the angels instruct Lot to flee to the safety of the nearby hills. But the ever-reluctant Lot says, no, I'd rather go to another city. Lot liked his comforts. Recall that when he and Abraham parted ways, and Abraham gave Lot the choice of what part of the land he preferred for himself and his flocks, where did he choose? The area surrounding Sodom. He chose it. And the next thing we see is Lot living in a city. Lot obviously did not have a taste for the life of a nomad or for a shepherd. He wanted to reside in a more refined city, a place with the kind of atmosphere and comfort and security and easier life that it afforded him. That he was living in Sodom makes it clear he had turned his back on his heritage and way of life in favor of the other pagans. In many ways, Lot was a shadow of the tribes of the northern kingdom of Ephraim Israel who would, in time, turn their backs on their heritage in favor of taking on the lifestyle of their pagan Gentile neighbors. Keep in mind, though, that nowhere do we see Lot renouncing his faith in the God of Israel. See, Lot was not a bad man. It's just that Lot was weak, and he was prone to succumbing to the everyday temptations of the world. Lot's life is a good illustration of what we today refer to as a carnal Christian. As weak as was Lot's faith, and as apparently unusable Lot was for God's good purposes, God still saved him. Because Lot, after all, was one of the first Hebrews. But what a sad epitaph and summary we get of Lot's experience on earth. Lot asks to be sent to a small nearby city. In fact, the city was so small that its name is Zoar, which in Hebrew means small. Actually, what we're witnessing here is a name change. The city was, in, it was originally known as Bela. Now it's being called Zor. Now, Lot and his family arrive there, and quickly the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are obliterated. And the smoke was so thick, it rose so high, that Abraham, standing on a hill far off in Hebron, was able to see it. Then we find out exactly why God saved Lot. In verse 29, we're told it was because Abraham, Abraham had asked him to. It was because the righteous Abraham had pled for the life of his nephew Lot. 
the prayers of aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters need to be kept flowing to God. The prayers of a righteous person. And if you're saved, you're righteous before God. That can lead to the saving of the unsaved. Or even the rescuing of the saved but the weak. I have no doubt that my father's prayers are all that stood between me and the oblivion I deserved and was rapidly moving towards many, so many years ago. Perhaps the only thing that can del deliver or even sustain the lives of our children and our grandchildren is our prayers. And I have no doubt that Lo was oblivious that it was his uncle Abraham who had interceded for him and kept him from destruction. But the ever weak Lot wasn't satisfied with his safe heaven, safe, safe haven in Soar. Behaving as a carnal believer and yet in another bad judgment, Lot left the place God had prepared for him, taking his two daughters with him, and they moved into a cave up in the hill country. Now, Lot, because of his fears and lack of obedience, lack of discipline and faith, had put his daughters into a terrible predicament. They were now in a remote location and far from any husband prospects. Archaeology has shown that the area to which Lot and his two daughters migrated was utterly barren, without population centers during this time. His daughters, physically mature enough to bear children, would have been terribly ashamed not to have children because that was the primary duty of a woman in those days. So now, without husbands, apparently yet to bear any children, the sisters made a pact with each other. They were going to get their father drunk, have sex with him so they'd have children. Now, this seemed perfectly fine to their twisted little minds, for they had been raised in the city of Sodom, where this sort of wicked act would have been par for the course. But this was not normal, not even in Bible times. A man fathering children by his own daughters was looked down upon, and the result of this abomination was that two children would go on to become the founders of the nations of Moab and Ammon, two arch enemies of Israel and therefore of God. It's amazing what our selfish and faithless acts can lead to. Let's read a little bit more of Genesis. Let's start in verse 23, chapter 19, and we'll go to the end. By the time Lot had come to Zoar, the sun had risen over the land, and then Adonai caused sulfur and fire to rain down upon Sodom and Gomorrah from Adonai out of the sky. He overthrew those cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and everything growing in the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a column of salt. Avraham got up early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before Adonai and looked out toward Sodom and Gomorrah, scanning the entire plain. There before him the smoke was rising from the land like the smoke from a furnace. But when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, uh, Abraham, uh, Avraham and sent Lot out away from the destruction when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. So Lot went up from Zoar and lived in the hills with his two daughters because he was afraid to stay in Zoar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. The firstborn said to the younger, Our father's old. There isn't a man on earth to come into us in the manner customary of the world. Come, let's have our father drink wine, then we'll sleep with him, and that way we'll enable our, our father to have descendants. So they plied their father with wine that night. The older one went in and slept with their father. He didn't know when she lay down or when she got up. The following day, the older said to the younger, Here, I slept last night with my father. Let's make him drink wine again tonight. You go in and sleep with him, and that way we'll enable our father to have descendants. They plied their father with wine that night also, and the younger one got up and slept with him, and he didn't know when she lay down or when she got up. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The older one gave birth to a son, called him Moab. He is the ancestor of Moab to this day. The younger also gave birth to a son. She called him Ben-Ami. He is the ancestor of the people of Ammon to this day.
We've come now to the Bible story that has gained such universal legendary status, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. What's really rather odd, I think, is that where one would expect some kind of a long and agonizingly detailed account of this cataclysm, something so horrific we pay very close attention to it and do what we could to avoid the same fate, we have but four or five total verses about it. To say detail is lacking is kind of an understatement. All we're told is that the destruction came from the sky, it came down like a rain of fire and brimstone, burning sulfur. It is an interesting choice of words, you see, because burning sulfur was used to burn up the garbage dumps located just outside the walls of ancient cities. Once lit, sulfur burns with a high heat, and it emits such a strong and definite odor that it could mask the foulest of other common odors. And of course, fire purged pests and disease. We're also aware that fire in the Bible is symbolic of purging evil and also of refining precious metals. God destroyed what he saw as a garbage heap. A garbage heap of perverted humanity using a method sure to be understood by all who knew of this judgment. Well, rather than focus on the horror and death and divine retribution, the Bible story of Sodom and Gomorrah focuses on the moral aspects that caused the destruction. The means of destruction is almost incidental. Now, what do we make of this phrase in verse 26, whereby Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt because she looked back as she was fleeing. The Hebrew term not looking back is an idiom. It means you shouldn't dally, you shouldn't hesitate. What appears to have actually happened is that Lot's wife didn't heed the warnings so she kind of lagged behind reluctantly. The angels, along with Lot and the two daughters who were still living at home, pulled her outside the city, but she must have stopped just outside the city walls. The indication is that immediately upon Lot and his family stepping outside the city walls, the destruction began. Lot's wife suffered essentially the same fate as the other inhabitants of the city. Now, it's long been thought that this tradition about her becoming a pillar of salt was a redaction sometime after the Jewish exile to Babylon. The oldest traditions do not seem to know this part of the story. They don't acknowledge it. We're not going to linger here because it's a riddle that we're certainly not going to solve. Well, in verse 27, Abraham is reinjected now into this continuing Torah saga. He awakens. He stands on a high place. He sees the smoke of the district of Sodom rising far off into the distance like a furnace, it says. Now I wonder, did Abraham have faith that God would save his nephew Lot from this now completed destruction? We're not told. And while Abraham had bargained with God that if ten righteous people remained in that wicked place, he would not destroy Sodom. Lot was never mentioned by name. We can safely assume Abraham was bargaining for Lot's sake, but can we so confidently assume that Abraham felt certain Lot would be saved? I doubt it. I think the hope was that if Lot had remained righteous, something which Abraham would not have known for sure, then would God spare Lot and his family? And Jehovah's answer was, yes, he would. Was Lot still righteous in God's eyes? That's another matter. I can't know for sure. But as we have watched Abraham's life, we do know that he was just a man. And who would not have wondered if Lot had died amidst the ruins of Sodom or perhaps survived? You know, I wonder who among us, with children and grandchildren, don't watch them and wonder at times, are they saved? 
will they be saved? Will the ones who seem to have wandered so far away from the ways of the Lord be rescued from the coming time of destruction? We can hope, but often we don't know for sure. All we can do is pray, which is really what Abraham was doing in his bargaining session with the Lord. Praying for the survival of the righteous, the rest is in God's hands. Well, the last nine verses of Genesis chapter 19 are historically quite important. They chronicle the birth of two nations that will become the enemies of Israel, Moab and Ammon. And if we could sum this up in a soundbite, it would be that Moab and Ammon were born of sin, so their destiny was sin. We know from the narrative that Lot is an older man and that the family of three was now living in a cave to the hills east of the Dead Sea. Obviously, some time's passed because the two daughters of Lot were becoming, becoming increasingly concerned that they'd not be able to fulfill the entire purpose that women of that era believed they were put on to this earth to do, to give birth to the next generation. We don't need to think too far out of the box to understand from the statement in verse 31 that our father is old, there is no man on earth to come into us in the manner customary of the world. This family was convinced that they were as Noah and his small family world. They may well have been the only people left on planet earth as a result of God's judgment on the world. The two girls apparently did not understand that what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah was a localized disaster. And it would seem that neither did Lot understand that. Now we watched Lot become more and more fearful, less interested in facing the world, more interested in assuming there was little left to do but eke out a meager existence and die when his time came. Quite literally, the, the uh, three remaining family members of Lot thought they might have witnessed the end of the world. Now, does faith bring fears of this kind? <clears throat> Heavens no. I mean, are you living in a constantly fearful state? I can assure you fear is not from God. <clears throat> and it has nothing to do with being God-fearing. The two daughters ply their father with wine. They get him drunk. They have sex with him in order to get pregnant. The older daughter was the first to bear a child, Moab. The younger produces Ben-Ami, who will later be called Ammon. Now these verses and others in Deuteronomy and the Psalms attest to the kinship of the people of Moab on Ammon to Lot. Sometimes Moab Moab and Ammon are, are referred to as brothers. But that was just a common way of speaking as we speak of one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, even though we do not have direct familial bonds. <clears throat> it is interesting that in Deuteronomy, two nations are singled out as being those with which intermarriage to Israelites may not take place. Moab and Ammon. And we know from archaeology that Moab and Ammon were well-established nations long before the Exodus. And by the way, Ammon, the capital of Jordan, is just the Arabic pronunciation of the ancient territory of Ammon, which the kingdom of Jordan today occupies. Here's the last we'll hear of Lot and what an inglorious epitaph is written for him. What an unsavory last chapter of his life is left for posterity. How long he lived, we don't know. What he did from this time forward, we don't know. We only know that he lived anything but a victorious life, and he produced descendants that the Lord wanted to keep completely separate from his chosen people, those produced through Abraham, Abraham Isaac, and Jacob. So here's a pattern to notice. We earlier saw that Abraham and Lot went their separate ways. 
because their herds and their flocks grew too large, so there's this constant hostility between the two groups. Lot chose the way of the world, and he went to go live with people he obviously preferred and identified with at Sodom. Abraham chose to stay identified to Jehovah and to stay separate and to remain in the promised land. Division, election, separation. And thus, when Lot produces heirs and descendants by means of family incest, primarily the nations Ammon and Moab, we find that those heirs and descendants of his were divinely ordained to remain divided and separated away from God's chosen people. Let's move on to Genesis chapter 20. Complete Jewish Bible, it's page 19. Genesis chapter 20. Avraham traveled from there towards the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. While living as an alien in Gerar, Avraham was saying of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. So Avimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Avimelech in a dream one night and said to him, you're about to die because of the woman you have taken since she is someone's wife. Now, Avimelech had not come near to her. So he said, Lord, will you kill even an upright nation? Didn't he himself say to me, she's my sister? And even she herself said, he's my brother. And doing this, my heart has been pure and my hands innocent. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that in doing this, your heart's been pure, and I too have kept you from sinning against me. This is why I didn't let you touch her. Therefore, return the man's wife to him now. He's a prophet. He'll pay, pray for you so that you'll live. But if you don't return her, know that you will certainly die, you and all who belong to you. Abimelech got up early in the morning, called all of his servants, and told them these things, and the men became very afraid. Then Avimelech called Avraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I sinned against you to cause you to bring on me and my kingdom a great sin? You've done these things to me that are just not done. And Avimelech went on asking Avraham, Whatever could have caused you to do such a thing? And Avraham replied, It was because I thought they could not possibly be in, uh, there could not possibly be any fear of God in this place. So they will kill me in order to get my wife. But she actually is also my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And so she became my wife. When God had me leave my father's house, I told her, do me this favor. Wherever we go, say about me, he is my brother. Avimelech took sheep, cattle, and male and female slaves and gave them to Avraham. And, she retur and he returned to him, Sarah, his wife. Then Avimelech said, Look, my country lies before you. Live where you like. To Sarah he said, Here, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. That will allay the suspicions of everyone who's with you. Before everyone, you are cleared. Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Avimelech and his wife and slave girls so that they could have children. For Adonai had made every woman in Avimelech's household infertile on account of Sarah. Abraham's wife. After the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham again becomes the focus. And here we find him on the move for generally the same reasons that any pastoralist moves to find fresh water and grazing land for his flocks and herds because the pasture resources where he'd been had been used up. There's no reason to assume from anything that the Bible has told us that he had moved beyond the hill country of Hebron, at least until this moment. Moving south now, Abraham stops, stops in Gerar, inland in an area that, in, that would in the not-too-distant future become known as Philistia, the land of the Philistines. In fact, it is entirely possible that the king of Gerar, Abimelech, was in fact an early Philistine settler. As it helps a great deal to understand the geography, to the, understand the associated event, it is pertinent to our study to know that, that the, the Kadesh, the 
place Kadesh that's spoken of here is the same place as the biblical Kadesh Barnea. It was some kind of a cult site, and it was a, a little distance into the barren Sinai. It had good water. It was undoubtedly a place where the Bedouins came from time to time to, to trade, to worship their gods, to get more supplies, so on. The place called Shur, in our verses, is actually in Egypt. Shur is a Hebrew form of the Aramaic word Shur'ah, which means a wall. Centuries before Abraham, the Egyptians had built a fortification wall, roughly along the lines of the modern-day Suez Canal. Its purpose was to protect them against these hordes of Asians to the north that um, constantly pestered Egypt. And as we're going to see in a few more chapters, eventually those Asians would overrun Egypt. They would actually rule Egypt for more than a century. Now, <clears throat> there is reasonable evidence that this wall existed about 400 years before Abraham, as in ancient Egyptian archives, there is a document the scholars have dubbed the Prophecy of Neferti, dated to that time. And in that document, there is already talk of the Great Wall of the Ruler that was built so the Asians couldn't come into Egypt. Well, there was a trade route that wound its way from Kadesh down to Shur, and it ran through Gerar, which later on is a part of Philistia. You know, <laughs> We'll close with this today. Sometimes we get this idea that all of these Bible characters were kind of ancient equivalents of Lewis and Clark, always blazing new trails to new destinations where people had never been before. And that's not the case at all. All of our Bible heroes moved to known places, traveled along long established trade routes. It's no different here in Genesis. We'll continue with this next week. Yes, you